it's my pleasure to uh, welcome all of you to our, uh, to our school choice conference here, uh, here this morning. Um, uh, first, uh, before we begin the panel, I would like to, uh, uh, to introduce our, uh, our, our moderator, uh, uh, Rick Garnett, who is uh, co-chairman of our uh, school choice subcommittee. Uh, he co-chairs that subcommittee with uh, Ted Cruz, uh, who will be moderating uh, one of our panels this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Garnett uh, is a uh, is a uh, attorney with the Washington D.C. law firm of uh, Miller, Cassidy, LaRocca, and Lewin. Uh, before uh, joining uh, the firm, uh, I guess uh, last last year, uh, two years ago rather, uh, Rick uh, served as a law clerk to. Uh, Chief Justice William Rehnquist, uh, and uh, uh, Rick will be making a slight uh, career change this fall. He will be joining uh, the faculty at the uh, University of Notre Dame School of Law. Uh, please join me in welcoming our moderator, uh, Rick Garnett. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we've all heard the, the saying that in America, all of the important policy and political questions eventually wind up in the courts. And uh, it looks like school choice is no exception. I think we're going to the, the policy debate that was heatedly going on between uh, Mr. Lawrence and Ms. Lewis is in Ohio and translated into the court system, just as it's done in, in other states. And we are uh, privileged today to have what I think is an all-star team of constitutional litigation and uh, scholarship on this issue. Um, I think court watchers and, and constitutional lawyers are going to agree that the question of whether the Constitution permits vouchers, and if so, under what conditions, and additionally, under what conditions might the Constitution require vouchers, uh, is one of the more, these are some of the more provocative and intriguing questions that are percolating in the courts now. Um, those of you who follow the issue will know, and I'm sure our panelists will fill us in on this, that the Supreme Court <laughs> Agostini decision has left a lot of people wondering sort of when's the other shoe going to drop if it does on, on the voucher question. They denied review of the Wisconsin decision which uh, permitted school vouchers in that state. Uh, there's a voucher case pending in the Supreme Court here in Ohio which uh, Mr. Jeff Sutton is going to tell us all about. And there's litigation also going on in, in Maine and Vermont and uh, the prospects appear that this is, uh, it's only going to increase in other states. So, I'm looking forward to learning a lot about this from our panelists. I should also say that uh, even the panelists uh, whom I never met before today, Mr. Shapiro and Mr. Minsper, I feel like I've, I've learned a lot from them because I've read and, and studied their briefs and uh, tried to respond to them. But <laughs> it's, it's been very educational for me. I really very much appreciate uh, their coming out here. Uh, to, just to go through our panel, first, Mr. Jeff Sutton is the former uh, state solicitor for the state of Ohio. He's argued four cases in the United States Supreme Court. Uh, I actually saw two of them when I was a law clerk and uh, thought he was great. And uh, in fact, he argued the uh, case about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in the city of Bernie and, uh, and did, did an excellent job. He's a graduate of the Ohio State University School of Law. And he's currently a counsel with uh, the grand old Ohio law firm of uh, Jones Day Reeves and Pope, where he's specializing in constitutional and uh, appellate litigation. We also have with us uh, Mr. Stephen Shapiro, who is the National Legal Director for the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, which is the nation's oldest and most established, probably well-known uh, civil rights organization. Uh, I think it's safe to say that he is one of the leading attorneys in the country on this issue, along with Mr. Mintzberg, who's um, advancing the argument that school vouchers uh, may not be constitutional, uh, especially if religious schools are included. So I, I certainly look forward to uh, issues on this. Mr. Shapiro is also very active, I think it's worth noting, in human rights issues around the world. So that, I think that brings an important perspective to this. Uh, Mr. Scott Somerville is a graduate of Harvard. He's with the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, where he's been since 1992. He's also a, had, a, had a life before being a lawyer, unlike some of us, in that he was a computer programmer and, and contributed something tangible to society. So I did not write Windows, though. <laughs> Did you present the internet? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but I've used a double blade of that. <laughs> uh, 
Mr. So Kevin has it down at the end here is the, uh, the grand high Puba of the uh, Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. He is uh, formerly a partner at the law firm of Williams and Conley, where he specialized and uh, headed up that firm's church state practice. He was in the office of legal counsel under President Reagan, where he also had the church state brief and was involved in several uh, several important cases. Uh, in fact, just recently, uh, Mr. Hassan's organization, the Beckett Fund, had a couple of big wins in one of the federal courts of appeals, one of which, I think it's interesting to know, was on the same side as the Jewish organization. They were working together to defend the rights of uh, Muslim police officers to wear, to wear religiously required beards. In the other case, Mr. Shapiro and Mr. Beckett were on the opposite side of a uh, public display case regarding a holiday display in a public place. So I think it just goes to show you that some of these church state uh, constitutional law issues uh, Across the various lines, if you sometimes think are too late and stone. Mr. Eugene Bollock uh, is a professor at UCLA Law School. Uh, he is one of the most prolific constitutional scholars in the country right now. Uh, he does a great deal of work in the area of First Amendment law, uh, in particular, studying uh, the degree to which uh, the Constitution requires or permits certain exemptions, general laws, for religious believers. Uh, he's a former law clerk which is Alex Kaczynski, Justice Sanjay O'Connor, and he also hosts uh, several internet discussion groups, which I think have done a lot to bring constitutional scholars together from all over the country. And finally, Mr. Mintzberg, Elliot Mintzberg, is the uh, legal director for the People for the American Way. Since uh, 1989, he, before that, he was an attorney at the D.C. law firm of Hogan and Harson. And again, Mr. Mintzberg has participated in this led the team in many of the cases that are currently pending or that have been decided on the school choice issue. So I think uh, in our panelists together, we really do uh, have, have the dream team on this issue. And I think we're very honored to have them. Please join me welcoming our first speaker, Mr. Sutton. Thank you, Rachel. I really ought to have a lot to say about this subject. I'm not sure how much I will say today. I not only have defended the Ohio pilot school voucher program for the last, I guess it's uh, three or four years, but I also have been defending the Ohio's school funding case, which I hope to talk a little bit about today in terms of the interrelation between those two issues. I have a child in public school, child in private school, and I'm a former teacher. In fact, the I've always thought that I've gotten stuck into these issues because I made the mistake of leaving teaching and I sold my soul to go to law. So I, uh, we'll see if that proves correct. The, um, let me, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the uh, voucher program in Ohio, how it works, the kids that are the beneficiaries of it, some of the legal arguments, the status of the case, and then a few thoughts of my own uh, concerning this issue and, and where I think it will go, both as a matter of policy and as a matter of constitutional law. Uh, the, the law was enacted in 1995. Uh, it first went into effect in the school year starting the fall of 1996. So we're now finishing the third school year. Uh, there are now about 4,000 kids in the program. It started out K through three. Of course, kids have moved through the program, so we've now got a K through five. Uh, as some of the speakers <coughs> suggested earlier this morning, the beneficiaries of the program, I think few people would debate this, uh, are truly the down and out in Cleveland. Uh, the first 1,500 scholarships in the first, uh, first year went to families with an average income, family income of $6,500 per family, well below the poverty line. 78% of the beneficiaries were minorities. 72% were economically disadvantaged. That, excuse me, 72% figure represents Cleveland in its entirety. The beneficiaries are all well below category of economically disadvantaged. And the, the beneficiaries all come from a school district that has this result from the following study. Starting in 1990-91, going through 95, uh, the state auditor monitors kids starting in the eighth grade, what happened to them by the time they reached the twelfth grade. The st statistics are really you know, quite startling and disheartening. Forty-six percent of the kids they were looking at in the eighth grade, so those are kids that had gotten to the eighth grade, 46% of them dropped out by the 12th grade. 21% had stayed in school but did not graduate for one reason or another. And just a third, 33%, managed to graduate. Only 9% of 
of kids in the, I think this is 96 or 97 school year, only 9% of the kids in the whole school district managed to pass all four sections of the state proficiency test. And all of this, despite the fact that the Ohio, the Cleveland school district gets more money than any, any other school district from the state and spends more per child on state money than any other district in the state. So clearly money is, is not going to answer the woes of the Cleveland school district. Now the litigation, as many of you may know, started soon after the program was enacted. Lawsuits, lawsuits were filed in early 1996. Uh, there was very active litigation in the Court of Common Pleas down in Franklin County, Columbus. Uh, the trial judge there ruled in favor of the state and allowed the program to go into its first year. The Court of Appeals subsequently reversed that decision, a 3-0 decision, and then there were stay motions filed at the Ohio Supreme Court. The Ohio Supreme Court allowed the program to continue pending appeal. That's why it's now possibly about to enter its fourth year and why we now have 4,000 kids in the program. Last September, there was an argument before the Ohio Supreme Court on the case dealing both with several federal issues concerning the Establishment Clause and several state law issues, some dealing with the state religion clauses, some with some uh, other provisions of the state constitution, such as a single subject guarantee and a uniformity clause. We still have not heard from the court, uh, but we could conceivably get a decision uh, you know, any week. The, the, the general contentions, and of course I have a, a slight bias here, I am, I am charged with defending the, the state uh, position. Uh, the, the main contention we, we've raised, the main argument we have raised on the religion clause issues is that the program is perfectly constitutional for these two reasons, both well-founded and precedent. One, it's perfectly neutral. There's nothing about the program that prevents a school from participating because it's religious or not religious, because it's private or, or public. Uh, the neighboring public schools that surround Cleveland are allowed to participate in the program if they want. And within Cleveland proper, not only can you, you already have the pre-existing public schools as an option, but any private school can participate. That's whether they're religious, non-religious, or partly religious, partly not religious. No distinctions whatsoever. The second reason it's constitutional is that not one penny of state money goes to a religious school, to the extent religious schools are participating, except through the individual choices of the families that choose to participate. So the connection between church and state, which is prohibited by the Establishment Clause, is broken in every respect, in respect to every child, because no kid ends up in a, a religious school unless they decide to go there, and therefore no dollar of state money ends up in a religious school unless that intervening private choice has occurred. So in that respect, we think it's very much like the GI Bill at the college level, which most constitutional scholars assume is constitutional, and which the court suggested was constitutional in a 1973 decision called Nyquist. Now, one of the responses to this argument, that this is really very much like the GI Bill, is, well, that was a program for college students, and this is a program for young children, in fact, very young children, kindergartners right now through fifth grade, so we're talking five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-olds, and the court has indeed said on several occasions that we have to be particularly careful when it comes to the influences of religion on younger children. Lee versus Weissman is a good example of that, the high school graduation prayer case. I, I think that that gets the, the, the question and the answer wrong. This is not a GI pro bill program in the sense of influencing young children and potentially put them, putting them in an environment where they can be susceptible to the influences of teachers uh, that, you know, that their parents are not aware of. There's not a single five, six, seven, eight-year-old kid, I have two around that age, that gets to school except for the choice of their parents. The notion that these kids end up in these six, uh, these kindergarten, first, first grade classrooms and are suddenly susceptible to influences of religion because they're too young to check out what's going on, to, too young to, to discriminate as to which school they should go to, really makes no sense at all. At this level, with this type of program, the people making the choices are, of course, parents. This is a GI Bill program for parents, not for kids. In all instances, best I can tell in the Cleveland case, it's the parents that are the ones making these choices, and that'll be true even if the program continues all the way through the 12th grade. Another argument that was made, and actually an argument that prevailed at the Court of Appeals level, is that the program really doesn't offer neutral choices. And the reason the choices aren't neutral, the argument goes, 
is because the choice a Cleveland parent faces in the Cleveland school system is not a very equivalent one. On the one hand, they can go to the Cleveland public schools, which all agree are not doing well. On the other hand, they can go to some of these new private schools or some pre-existing private schools, which are doing very well. The argument then is that that's not a neutral choice. That too can't possibly be right, because if that's right, and if that premise controls, that means that voucher programs would be legitimate only in school systems that were thriving and succeeding. If one knows the Cleveland area, that would mean a, a, private, a voucher program would work and be constitutional in Shaker Heights, but not in their city, city Cleveland. And again, I can't believe that that's correct. Another argument that has been pushed aggressively, and I think had some impact in the Court of Appeals decision here, is that it varies each year, because each year you've got different percentages of kids enrolled. But it's the percentage of participating schools that have a religious orientation. And in the program, I think it's fair to say it's roughly 70 to 80 percent of the kids in the program are going to a religious school. Lots of different religions represented. We've got Islam, uh, Orthodox Jewish, Catholic, uh, Evangelical, Christian, Protestant, and plenty of different religions. But 70 to 80 percent of the schools, or at least the kids attending schools in the program, are going to religious schools. I, th I think the problem with focusing on percentages is at least twofold. Uh, one, that's not a uh, ultimate constitutional answer in this area. I, I've said this to both court levels. If that's their interest, if that's what the U.S. Supreme Court ultimately says, the state can easily deal with it. Just give us a percentage and we'll comply with it. If the percentage is we want no more than 15% of the schools to be religious, that'll be our rule. If they want it to be 50%, that'll be our rule. So I don't think that's a complete answer. But I think worse than that, it asks the state to be some, something, doing something it shouldn't be doing. And that's determining how many schools, how many kids can participate based on their religious orientation, which strikes me as a very serious free exercise uh, problem. One, incidentally, we have raised in the case. Uh, and and the, the last one, which, which I have the hardest trouble trying candidly to respond to, is the notion that this program is designed to somehow help religious schools, particularly the Catholic schools. Um, the reason I have such a hard time with that argument is because I have a real sense for what has happened in Cleveland over the last 30 years. Uh, busing in Cleveland was, did a lot of positive things, and, and there are some very good arguments for busing. There are some very good arguments in retrospect against busing. But few people can deny the fact that one of the great impacts of busing is that a lot of folks left inner city Cleveland. And a lot of schools left inner city Cleveland. And one of the only private school systems that remain in Cleveland is the Catholic schools. And in truth, the Catholic schools have had their own voucher program for a long time. They've been doing this very thing as a mission for at least 30 years now. The notion that they are somehow behind this particular program trying to increase the number of students in their schools is, is really a, a little bit offensive. Uh, when everyone else chose to leave the Cleveland school kids behind, whether it was the state, whether it was the money, whether it was the businesses, whether it was the middle class, this was one of the few groups that cared enough to try to do something about it. Uh, the, the final reason there's no uh, serious charge that this is an effort to benefit either these schools or other religious schools is that the tuition is so low. Uh, a voucher only entitles you to $2,500. Uh, you can only use, it's, it's a $2,500 voucher, but you can only use $2,250 of it. The remaining 10% has to be provided by your own uh, income or by services to the school. And uh, most of these schools are not making money at that rate. In fact, I think most people in this room would agree that it's very difficult to make money at that particular rate. I think the real fight in this area is not over the Constitution, but it's over policy, where I do think there are some very serious arguments here, many of them addressed earlier. But that, to me, strikes me as the best reason for allowing this program to proceed, because it is, after all, an experiment. I think it's very dangerous to have too much certitude on either side of this debate until we have empirical evidence which shows what happens with these schools. Are test scores going up? Are parents happy? Are kids doing well? Or maybe, I think this may be true, I, I taught. It's not easy to teach, and it's even harder to teach in the inner city. It may be that some of these schools can't do as good a job as the public schools. But no one knows that, and I think it's dangerous to say you do know it now. The other interesting thing to me, and I've obviously had reason to think about this, defending both the voucher program and the school funding lawsuit, is I think there is a real connection both in Ohio and nationally 
between the two types of litigation. And the way I see it is this. The way to win the school funding type lawsuits, and these are challenges to state systems along the grounds that there's too much inequality between the poor and the wealthy in the public school system within a state. The way to win those lawsuits is to push a very aggressive PR campaign that the public schools aren't working, and that they're not working in rural parts of the state, and they're not working in the inner cities. And that's exactly what has happened in Ohio, with great success, I should add, as a, a victim of the campaign, and a very serious loser in our case, uh, with no bitterness, I should add. Uh, but, but, but I, I think it's been a very productive effort. I mean, in one sense, you could argue it's very productive. In Ohio, funding has gone up. And in many respects, the plaintiffs have gotten what they set out to do. But I would say, at the same time, it's been a great cost. And the cost is that I think the public in general, not constitutional lawyers, not public school teachers, but just the public in general, is losing confidence in public schools because of these attacks on the system. And I think many of them are overstated. And as a result, there are many misperceptions, which I think feed this school choice debate. Well, I'll close here, and I apologize if I've gone too long with my last point, which is how in the world is the, Ohio, uh, the US Supreme Court, excuse me, going to decide this case? And I'll, I'll turn to something I know even less about than vouchers, and that's literature. <coughs> Frost wrote a poem called Mending Wall, which has nothing to do with the Establishment Clause, except it does offer a great metaphor for this case. Mending Wall is about two farmers that return each spring to the wall that divides their two farms. With, uh, many rocks have fallen from the wall during the, the, the thaw, coming from the winter freeze, after the winter freeze. And they ret return each spring to repair the wall together. And the, the gist of the poem is the ambivalence about having a wall between two neighbors, which has lots of interesting components to it. And it also has lots of interesting parallels to this case. The poem expresses an ag agnostic view about the wall. On the one hand, it says the classic line, good fences make good neighbors very pro-establishment, steep wall between church and state approach. But then it also says something there is about a wall that doesn't like it and wants to tear it down. If you know the poem, they go back and forth. Not sure whether it's good fences make good neighbors or something there is that doesn't like the wall and wants to tear it down. But finally, they pose the question this way. And I, I really think this is the way the court will pose it. And I think it's what will answer the question as to how the court decides this issue. Frost says, if I were going to build a wall, I would want to know what I was going to wall now. And I think that would be the question for the court. Are the voucher programs, is what's going on here, would they be walling out state support for religion, or are they walling out state support for the educationally disadvantaged? Now, it's, it's how they frame the question. If they frame it one way, these things will be upheld. If they frame it the other, they'll go down. Thanks very much. <laughs>
I'm also going to restrict myself to the federal constitutional question. Um, uh, Jeff did not, did not mention uh, this, and I'm sure many of you know this, that all the various voucher cases that have been litigated so far around the country, and he recited the list, uh, have been litigated in state court. They have all raised the state constitutional claims as well as federal constitutional claims. Uh, and a series of the voucher programs at various levels of various court systems, including in Ohio, uh, have been struck down sometimes on state constitutional grounds as well as federal constitutional grounds, and in other instances only on state constitutional grounds. Uh, so there are very serious issues um, uh, under many state constitutions in which the states are going to be the final arbiter. In those cases, if resolved on state constitutional grounds, if the program is struck down on state constitutional grounds in the United States Supreme Court, um, they will end at the, uh, at the state Supreme Court. Um, and finally, uh, when we talk about vouchers, uh, it's important to, to, to define is that we mean by that term, because obviously there are different voucher programs that can be constituted in different ways. But what I'm going to be talking about this morning, what I, I, I understand to be the thrust of the panel, uh, our voucher programs are eligible for, to students who attend uh, private sectarian schools as well as private secular schools. When the Wisconsin program was initially established, the uh, vouchers were only available uh, to uh, parents who chose to send their children to private secular schools. Uh, there was a lawsuit about that, claiming that that was a violation of the free exercise clause, which was uh, rejected in the federal district court in Wisconsin. The program was ultimately then extended by the legislature to include sectarian schools. Uh, but for purposes of this debate, I think we should assume we're talking about voucher programs um, that can be used at private sectarian schools as well as private uh, uh, secular schools. Now, to me, um, uh, the question posed by voucher programs um, so defined is a very elementary one. Um, and this is what I think the question is. Does the establishment clause permit the use of public money to fund religious instruction for elementary and secondary school students in pervasively sectarian institutions? That, I think, is the establishment clause question that's posed by voucher programs. And if the answer to that question is yes, if the Establishment Clause permits the use of public money to fund uh, religious instruction for elementary and secondary school students uh, in pervasively sectarian institutions, then there is no principled reason, I think, why the government couldn't simply um, eliminate what is largely the charade of doctors and just fund parochial schools directly. As we fund private schools, we could fund parochial schools. Now, whatever else uh, you may think about that, I think the notion that the government could directly fund parochial school education in this country, at the very least, James Madison, who wrote the Memorial and Remonstrance Against Religious Ass Assessments, and then later played a principal role in writing the Establishment Clause, I think would also be a shock, quite frankly, uh, to the Supreme Court. Uh, there are a lot of things that are unclear in the Supreme Court's Establishment Clause jurisprudence. The Supreme Court itself has conceded um, that its um, Establishment Clause cases often shed uh, uh, more confusion than light, create more confusion than certainty. It can be said with certainty is that the Supreme Court has never, in the 50 years of modern law, come close to upholding a program that involved a massive transfer of public money to school and uh, for parochial school education. The only time the Supreme Court that remotely resembled that was in the 1973 case that Jeff cited, Pearl versus Nyquist. He cited it for the Supreme Court's footnote distinguishing the GI Bill. What he did not mention was the holding of the case in 1973, which said a tuition reimbursement plan um, that was available, among others, to parents who send their kids to parochial school was an unconstitutional violation of the Establishment Clause. So I begin with the premise that if the court adheres to establishment clause jurisprudence, there's only one answer it can possibly do, and that's uh, uh, education is unconstitutional in violation of the establishment clause. So like Jeff, or what the responses are to, to my starting, the constitutional starting point, which is a very different placeable analysis, and I think there are two sets of responses. One is factual and one is legal. Now, one of the factual responses is to say it's not true. You're creating not the same as directly funding parochial school education because the voucher goes to the parent we have here is parental is parent and the exercise of parental choice. 
And sometimes the state employees who receive their paycheck from the state and are obviously free, the ACLU would be the first to contribute a portion of their earnings to the church or any other charity they, they, they choose to support and make their state paycheck and turn around and, and contribute a certain percentage to their church. Obviously, if it's not contribution, a violation of the Establishment Clause. To the contrary. Uh, but the apt analogy for the following reason, when the government gives you a paycheck as a state employee, true free as a parent, you truly have parental choice. To use that money however you see that your rent, you can use it to go on your vacation, you can use it to contribute to charity, you can put it in the bank, go for the voucher program. The state gives you a voucher. What the state does, sometimes frequently they mail it to the school. It has the parent's name on it, but it must be strictly right? It must be endorsed over to the school. You don't have the option of going to the school, pick up the check, thank you very much, I think I'd rather buy Cleveland Brown tickets with this money. Um, that's not your choice. You directly endorse it over, over, over to the school. So it's very different than the paycheck the, in the states. Um, and let me just, let me just uh, say one other small thing about a feature of Ohio, but it's true in various other places. Uh, Jeff was talking about the amount of money. In truth, there are several places around the country where the, the voucher exceeds the cost of the tuition that the school would otherwise charge the parent. That's the case. Then the parochial school is getting more from the state than they would otherwise ask the parent of that sort to characterize the voucher payment as a benefit to the parent. Uh, so I think that this, the notion of parental choice, when your only choice is to turn around and endorse over to them, a little bit misleading. The second argument is, is this argument of, of neutrality, and, and it basically goes like this. Um, voucher programs might be unconstitutional if they only provide schools, but in fact the benefit is written in broader terms. Right? It's available um, to, um, in the case of Ohio, it's available if you choose to send your kid uh, to a neighboring suburban school. There's also in Ohio a, um, a, uh, a program to reimburse parents for the cost. So the notion is this is part of a general educational scheme to help disadvantaged children, and whatever work the parochial schools are getting as a result of this is, is part of a neutral program, not conceived aid. Um, now, there are several, several problems with that. First thing is, it was interesting to me that when Jeff talked about to do what I thought he would do and what most people do when they talk about neutrality, and that is to say, well, if you're a parent who has it on schools and you're distressed by the education your child is receiving and you've made the parental decision to put your kid in private school, you have a choice between a sectarian school and a, and a secular school. And that's the, and the values, and that is the neutral component of the program. He didn't make that argument. Uh, what is the sheer numbers? And numbers really do matter, because in Ohio, as in most other places, the percentage of, of available and participating schools are parochial schools. Um, but putting that aside, I mean, it is the program is neutral because the state is funding, uh, at the same time, funding the public. Well, if the, if the this creation and maintenance of a public school system baseline for determining that a voucher program is neutral, then that truly is an argument which the state can then pay parochial schools directly the same for pupil expenditures that they're paying the, the legal system neutral. Right? On the one hand, you have the public schools. On the other hand, you have the parochial schools. We're giving the same amount of money. The definition of neutrality that the Supreme Court has ever adopted, nor did I think the Supreme Court lifetime. Now, um, there are also a series of legal, very quickly, that are made by voucher proponents, which I also think are, are, are flawed. Um, that's primarily to say, well, it may well be true that in 1973 in Pearl versus Nyquist, the Supreme Court struck down the old that looks anything like the current voucher proposals, but establishment clause changed uh, over the past 25 years. And the current Supreme Court has a different view of the established resolve that issue differently. Um, and proponents of this theory of an evolving establishment clause document uh, to five cases. Um, Mueller, Witters, Rosenberg, and Agostini in, 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 chrono in chronological order. Time this morning to go through each one of them individually, but suffice it to say, uh, they are all different. In, in. Let, me just, let me just talk for one moment about Agostini, because Jeff, uh, Jeff mentioned that, which to be sure, uh, reversed an earlier um, establishment clause by the Supreme Court um, and authorized the state to send its own um, teachers into the parochial schools to provide remedial instruction. But one of the things about Agostini is very, very careful to say that what made the New York program that it was considering in Agostini path, that the people going in to provide remedial instruction, albeit on the grounds of the parochial school, were public school employees in the control of the public school, sent in for the limited purpose of teaching secular subjects, and that there was no transfer of funds from the public fist. None of those things are true. None of those things are true in the voucher program. And so I read 
um, as support for the proposition that the Supreme Court will remain when it gets a voucher program, uh, when it ultimately gets a voucher program before it. The, uh, let me just say one other thing about, uh, about uh, Winters and program. It's, it's not, it wasn't quite a GI Bill program, but it was like a GI Bill program. It, it rose in Washington State, had a scholarship that was available to disabled um, students. And one of the recipients, beneficiaries of the scholarship program, decided that he wanted to use the scholarship to attend. Uh, and the question was, could you use the state scholarship to attend Divinity School? The Supreme Court said yes. Now, whatever may, one may think about that uh, decision, there is a, a both, I think, a doctrinal difference and a, and a common sense distinction between a program right, in which there are a handful of beneficiaries right, who will use that state funding at the university level, where they are less susceptible to indoctrination, at the university level, um, to obtain a religious education, and a program whose overwhelming purpose and effect is to promote and pay for, with public money, um, private sectarian <coughs> education, which is for elementary and secondary school students, which is what the voucher programs uh, are all about. Likewise, in Zobris, which was the case out of Arizona about whether the state could pay for a um, sign language interpreter for a deaf student who was attending a parochial school, and the Supreme Court said yes, there was no violation of the Establishment Clause. Um, there's a very, very big difference between a program that is designed to provide assistance to uh, physically disabled children, most of whom are not going to be attending parochial school. And when the aid takes the form of a sign language interpreter who functions not much differently than a, um, than a hearing aid, it simply enables the student to receive the message the student could not otherwise receive. But there is no transfer of funds. There is no transfer of funds into the parochial school treasury, which the administrators of the parochial school can then use for whatever purpose they want, including including religious religious instruction, which, which the parochial schools in Cleveland and every other city are very openly acknowledged is not only their their, their mission, but, but, but their right as far as they see. Um, finally, let me just end by, 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 saying, by saying one last comment about, about neutrality. Uh, part of what underlies constitutionally, part of what underlies um, this, this whole constitutional debate about the voucher program is the question of whether neutrality is indeed the supreme value of the religion clauses and the establishment clause in particular. So that as long as the government can make a plausible argument that it's not favoring religion, not favoring religion, that it must treat uh, religion as it would treat any other beneficiary of its social programs here, 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 here in the voucher system. Now, I would argue, number one, as I, as I tried to before, that I think this is a program that, that disproportionately benefits religion. But even if you're putting put that aside, uh, I think the, the, the conception that all the establishment clause is about is neutrality really confuses the law of, the, of, of uh, free expression and the law um, that has grown up around the religion clauses. Um, the free speech jurisprudence today is dominated by notions of neutrality. The establishment clause law isn't, never has been, and shouldn't be. It's not to say that neutrality is an irrelevancy. Neutrality is important, and, 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 and there are a whole variety of ways in which the state is properly barred from discriminating against religion. But when you're talking about funding for education, there are other values at stake as well. And let me just end by quoting Justice O'Connor. Um, who uh, confronted this very issue in Rosenberger. Uh, because the issue in Rosenberger, really, one of the issues in Rosenberger was, should the Establishment Clause be understood as simply a party? And she said the following. Um, she said, neutrality in both form of the Establishment Clause. I would agree with that. But there exists another axiom in the history and precedent of the Establishment Clause. And that is, public funds may not be used to endorse the religious message our decisions provide no precedent for the use of the finance religious activities. And so long as the Supreme Court remains faithful to that interpretation of these established laws, uh, I think it cannot uh, sustain the voucher programs that we are now seeing. I guess, <laughs> up until I was in the general council of uh, the uh, Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, where bipartisan from Washington protect, as we say, the free expression of all religious traditions. You heard about most of your uh, cases, there are Buddhist cases, there are Christian cases, there are Jewish cases. 
Imagine I am doing here is uh, we have a, a, a lot in an effort to invalidate a provision, actually two provisions, which I'll tell you about later. Um, the job is can be done of listening past the graveyard. I'll be happy to bench dinner at the restaurant of your choice. The one that can <laughs> if absolutely necessary. <laughs> On the issue, um, the, um, the Supreme Court has never questioned based on a massive uh, program of aid, which was a, a tax case, admittedly. The dissent pointed out the benefit went to parents of parochial school students. The majority of footnotes said care. Along came Witters, and uh, just, Justice tried to make an issue out of the fact that, yes, anybody knew it was going anywhere, and this wasn't a large-scale plan. Five justices and Bruce Mueller doesn't make a difference, and we still mean it. Now, there's the progress to Agostini. It's not like talking to the Cubs fans, take the average the chance. So I'm not going to do that, and I'm not going to be tempted into doing that. Instead, I'm going to talk about a substantial but surmountable obstinate up to 37 state constitutions and before modern establishment clause jurisprudence. Dates even before the last time in the way. Um, it's a, a dirty little secret called the Blaine. Now, if you haven't heard of it, that's because it's a dirty little secret. 37 state constitutions say in one form or another, pray in schools. Same word that Steve uses. Coincidence. It has a long, rich, storied, dirty. Let me tell you about it, and I'll tell you about the lawsuit we have to overturn it. In the 40s, there was a massive influx of Catholic immigration to America, largely driven by the, the uh, Irish potato ground. In the 1840s, the Catholic population of the country was alarming to the wasp hegemony in, in the 19th century. It was a real nativist movement uh, known as the Know Nothings. They weren't called Know Nothing. They were called Know Nothing because no one else was supposed to know anything of, of, of their activity. In 1854, in Massachusetts, the know-nothings controlled all the three seats in both houses of the legislature and controlled the governor's mansion. And in 1854, they did three things to contain this growing Catholic influx. And they made no bones about it. They put in the legislative history that they were taking these actions because they were worried about Irish Catholics diluting the Puritan tradition in Massachusetts. First thing they did was to create a commission for the investigation of nunneries. They were going to prove their root with all those convicts. And the second thing, and the third thing they did, which were much more, much more worrisome, they passed a law saying that the King James and only the King James Bible had to be used in all the so-called common schools. And in those days, reading the King James Bible for a Catholic was a lot like eating meat on Friday was in those days. The third thing they did was to pass an amendment saying public funds should ever be used for religious schools. <coughs> and they said, on the record, so the immigrants would never be able to afford to have their own school system. They'd have to go to the public schools where they would read the King James Bible and come out with little curators. In other words, the earliest opposition to school choice was on maintaining the government monopoly on education, precisely so that the state's bird ideology would be taught to kids instead of their parents' taught. Fast forward to 1917, the know nothings who were in Massachusetts. And by and large, they succeeded in keeping out of society. By and large. But there are a lot of them that also trend. So they amend the Constitution, not the second time, to say that the citizen ballot initiative process could never be used to amend the earlier amendment or amend this new amendment. They use it to amend the amendment, which couldn't amend the amendment. Um, but they thought. Even the. Um, against this is specifically Catholic fashion. <coughs> Let's go back to the early 20th century, back into the 19th century. This catches fire in the Civil War when the Republicans need an issue to replace blaming the Democrats. So Grant picks up the, this nativist issue and takes it, takes it now and for a federal amendment that would do at what this uh, amendment did in Massachusetts and other places. It was put Blaine, it became known as the Blaine Amendment. It nearly passed. It uh, held by a positive vote of 28 to 16, just, just a little bit shorter than two-thirds. And because it caught fire again at the, at the, the state level, which now, by not know nothing, know nothings look like altar boys, something called the American Protective Association, 
requires members to take an oath that they would oppose Catholicism at every turn. Between 1850 and 1917, 37 states pick up the is the subject of scholarly dis dispute the amendments or just coincidences. Uh, there are things in the state constitution that are basically this effect. 17 of them have real teeth. I'm not going to tell you which 17 of them. 17 of them have real teeth. The other 20 could interpret them differently than they've interpreted them in the past. In, in Massachusetts, <coughs> to invalidate, and they, they beat them to the punch by about 20 years. Um, which is to say that Rome, state constitutions could not be used to entrace it in this case. Colorado had amended its constitution. Court said it couldn't do that. Well, to disable specific groups of people, what rules do you maintain blade amendments? That's my question. And in particular, how amendment, not the second amendment, the other amendment, so that uh, this invalid initiative from ever challenging their blade amendment. Uh, the motion to dismiss, um, is we brought it on behalf of a handicapped mom, um, whose son, her oldest daughter, I'm sorry, the parochial school on the take cannot afford to send her second child there, precludes them from going to any but the most expensive schools that she can afford. The um, Massachusetts <coughs> Attorney General has been fighting us on candidly admit some cocktail party conversation that they're in trouble. The um, interesting, or one of the interesting things is that in one of their standing appendix, you don't have standing to challenge ballot initiative. We do too, but <coughs> just are interested in ballot initiative. So on their own, with their own next year, to repeal the plan amendment, and now about the sufficiency of their signatures. Um, on the other side, haven't quite shown up. Teachers Union, Steve's group isn't on the map yet, Elliot's isn't on the map. But because what do you say about blame amendments? The Supreme Court just said in, in, in a holding school choice by uh, Nicole Garnett, Rick's wife, for we don't think this is a blame amendment, but if we did, we couldn't. So what do you say? The best argument that could be made is that, well, they don't mean the bigotry anymore. But you know what? That's not good enough. The Supreme Court, in a case called Hunter, 1985, struck down part of the Alabama Constitution and, uh, or disenfranchised uh, people convicted of it. The Supreme Court said, we know what this was all about. This was a way to basically lice Americans. And it doesn't matter how many years it passed. This is an African American. Law. The same thing is true of later. Um, I will uh, run on about this in the request of section. Without but I will end here, other than where I started, susceptible to indoctrination were the code words for the blame of the people, other than taken out of the code words, and nothing other than being taken is just a very nasty word for somebody else's religion. Thank you. A lot more telling is going to have to be the, the uh, crap word a little bit, and main panel is to try to watch that 10 to 12 minutes just so we can get everybody in. Thanks a lot. Come on. <laughs> All I need to that exhortation because I've got about 50 minutes worth. It's Scott Somerville filling in for my boss, Mike Ferris, the president. Of I'm so delighted to be here, but I do feel a little bit like the guy who stands and knows any reason why these two may not be lawfully joined in holy matrimony. I'm speaking for a large majority of homeschoolers who are passionately for but who are very much against vouchers as a means to achieve that. I'm speaking a little bit about the policy issues that Mr. Shapiro didn't want to touch. About legal issues, and I'm going to be speaking about some practical and believe that vouchers, and by vouchers I mean government payments, school of the parent's choice. We believe that vouchers are, but that they are not wise. And the reason they're not wise is because they got people they can to use the political process, the legal process, local school districts to make sure vouchers prevent the marginal, grudging, maybe choice. We'll let you pick from a government with our vouchers, but we're not going to let anything like real con. Now, when I share about why homeschoolers are against vouchers, I find myself arguing with some very bright and very committed people who are usually smarter than I am, but then it's a lot longer uh, to come up and say what's wrong with vouchers. I want to share just for a moment my motives. I don't attack my motives because I find that in modern America is the easiest way to get any argument won. I was in Boone County, West Virginia. I'm one of six sons. My dad made $6,000 a year. County at that time was the third worst county school system in West Virginia. West Virginia was the third worst system in the United States of America. I was wretched. Now I was shipped to an elite 
prep school in New Hampshire. It took me three months to learn the backyard. But I went from there to Dartmouth College, and I went from there to Harvard Law School. And I am grateful. I got to this church, we got the cross firm on the lawn, all the Ku Klux Klan trappings, and the Christian leadership, black Christian leadership, public schools. My dad went to white, one black, he's a Presbyterian minister. White church paid him about 80% of his time with the black folk, because they were the ones he could help. Dad got fired and we wound up in Boone County. I'm passionate for poor families and for African American families. As a homeschooler, I've had a chance to get the government to pay for it yet. But we've helped single moms get out of failing public school systems and into something that works. We're here today, I'm here, because I believe that every needs a choice. I agree with what the Catholic Catechism is Presbyterian, to make it even worse. But the Catholic Catechism said to their children, parents have the right to choose a school for them which corresponds. This right is fundamental. Public authorities have the concrete conditions for its exercise. That's why laws in every state that keep parents from taking their children out and giving them the education of their choice. We're here to a chance. There's a debate between the folks from the LU and the folks from the people from the American Way as to how we give those care. Because I believe that parents need a choice for kids. Harvard Law School in 1989, I decided to writing a third year paper that would make totally for vouchers, because I was totally for choice. It was a study of the history of American education law. Got to go to the Luter Act back in Massachusetts in the early 1600s, government schools, and I followed it all the way forward, and what I found surprised disturbed me. I found that time after time, when the government intersected, it was a majoritarian control of values. Mr. I'm going to call you Mr. Beckett. That would be before the crazy. Yeah, he died. He died. Uh, <laughs> my name's Kevin. He died. Okay. Uh, but Kevin Hassan. Kevin Hassan, right. Mr. Hassan has done a brilliant job of sharing perspective what the dirty 19th century was like for Catholics. You know, it was really shocking for me to read through what my ancestors had done. My ancestors had done was really bad. Not only am I a Protestant Protestant, and my, my triple great uncle was a spy for the but when I look at what my white Protestant ancestors have, I'm ashamed. Now, I'm not the president of the United States, so I don't think so. I just get to do something about it myself. One is just making sure that Catholic folk, black folk, poor folk have a chance. I'm going to quote from uh, Professor Stephen Carter, and because he is a Yale law professor. Uh, I don't normally try to make a, a point about who's black the perspective of a moderate to liberal black law professor. Our, believes that the purpose of schools is to persuade them. The purpose is clothed in the gentle language of preparing young distractors from the argument underneath. Good adults, the way the dominant group does. And this truth is the same, whether the dominant century, that's the know-nothings, or progressive or anti-communist populist in the middle of this century, or theorists style that it was right. And each group astonished. Reason could be that the opposition was evil, for not allow them to be sacrificed to somebody else's schoolers. Believe that. Homeschoolers make day. We're, they're about as many homeschoolers as there are Jews. As passionate about their freedom, and the, as I find that most American Jews do. I am oppressed. Fought for religious liberty for all Americans. Have gone after legal barriers. The fact that homeschoolers are doing just what they did, and doing homeschoolers are terrified that the government will use its power over the inculcation of values in the private science, and free markets don't work when the government comes. Um, and I'm really excited about the free market in education. I, I tell you a lot about what computer technology is doing, internet. You see, homeschoolers don't get anything from the government. They don't have to worry, like the teachers' union, that a computer might replace some radical changes in the way education can be delivered. So, you know, if the government doesn't step in and mess this up, and about 20 years it costs now, except for the fact that somebody's got children. But we won't get into that. See, the free money, and not everyone has money. It's one, I've got an education. My wife's able to stay home at our house. But there are a lot of folks in the Huff neighborhood who don't have a Harvard or a Dartmouth degree. What? Well, we fight for school choice. That, we're not fighting some passive people who are just as intense in winning the fight as I apologize to those members of teachers' unions who are who I'm not challenging their motives, they're just hurt. They're tenacious, and they have a whole lot more control than the homeschoolers do. We find this time after time, school district level, at the State Department of Education, continuously coming up trying to shut down homeschools, and what do you think? That'll be done for poor children. 
are people who have the motive, weapon, and opportunity. And I appreciate the fact that these countries, but when Elliot Minchberg is here, when Stephen Shapiro, I just remind you that the fight for vouchers is a battle in terms what we will wind up with is a tiny, saddled under, absolutely intolerable government regulation. In, uh, in the charter school book, and I just quote from the Washington Times, which oversees, ch oversees charter schools in enforcing the rules and regulations instead of whether children will operate. It's not about educational content. It's about making sure all the they, and he's speaking of the, of the monitoring board, they watch that. <coughs> Washington, who made this claim, the operator, monitoring board, might. Uh, Vouchers in the, I, I believe that the federal constitution has just ruled on the Arizona scholarship tax credit. Let me say, I am 100% as much for Arizona had to come up with as I am against pull on Arizona scholarship tax credit. Those of you who may not be committed to $500 of their own money to a scholarship fund and make money available to families. The, uh, the Supreme Court in Arizona quickly went through the smoothness violated the establishment clause. And they concluded that one was not a problem. And the purpose of it was pretty obvious. Um, the primary beneficiary of this was kids. Big schools benefited, but that was not the primary benefit. Clearly entangled the government with religion. Uh, you know, letting a taxpayer give their money to that money to go to the school of their choice. We've got so many layers of entangle anything. Now, the state constitutional questions were much more difficult. Several pages about the Blaine amendments. I am glad out of time. But in state after state after state constitution, runs head on into something that would to make sure that no penny of anybody to one of those papists. And I'm glad to hear say that the Arizona Supreme Court was at and refused to take last century's children. The Arizona for non-governmentally regulated it means that the black families, the poor families, the Hispanic families have a chance to make it that the teachers union is going to find it easy to control. In fact, the mayor said it was enacted into law forget the exact person from the teachers union was quoted as saying what was dark about it was not that it was choice control and probably cannot stop the kind of choice for that kind of freedom for I believe that vouchers for middle class risk of freedom I'd love to tell you why schools the way that government intervention will destroy small private schools would do middle class would do especially when we have a mechanism that work on constitution and the state constitution they provide out and posing any threats on the freedom of the rest of us. I'm Pat Sonoma. I never go anywhere without my visual. People fault me for not having, uh, for not having, this is a high enough technology. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, that's sort of reduced towards the end of your CLE material, view of the Notre Dame, Notre Dame uh, Journal of uh, Full Treatment is not established. I, is, is there a movable microphone? I'm trying to speak very loudly. Uh, I could just sit down, not establish Can you hear me back there? No? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, good. I could just. That's basically my point. Is talking about the details. Uh, I was sure that that is not their view. That sometimes they believe requires discrimination against clergy. That, some, that religious institutions, religious than otherwise equivalent secular. Sometimes the Supreme Court has, has said that. Sometimes she said that, although all the time she's, uh, uh, I think she's taken a much better view. It, when you treat something equally, you can't. To establish something means to put it above other, especially. Equal treatment is not a step. One of my points, the other, uh, related point is I think that this, uh, uh, framing this, and it's politically profitable for the fact, uh, it is an honest characterization of the debate. The fact that it seems to me we have some of the best traditions not tied here. That what this is about is whether consideration, and I think the answer is no. Is that if you look closely, uh, equal treatment is always not thought of established. That there's nothing remarkably so choice. The argument the other side makes is to permit the use of public money to fund religious and pervasively sectarian institutions. Uh, qualified, for, said without the qualifiers to say that you can't take it. So here it goes. The taxpayers, the government, which gives vouchers to parents, indirectly goes to religion, and that is bad. And that's an argument, but it is not all there is to it. 
that in fact unlock this evil process. Now that this kind of process happens all the time, through GI Bill money, student loans, and student credit to religious schools. Sometimes pervasively stops a, a university that uses GI Bill money. Sectarian. Nothing wrong with that. Or paychecks to welfare recipients or government employees. The money, uh, 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 or in fact, even spend their money at religious <coughs> charitable income tax deductions, essentially, to religious schools. Now, you get tax exemption, and it's not a subsidy. Except, of course, the court has said legally, tax exemptions are the government, when you're in the 40, uh, uh, says if you give money to a ch allow you to, to uh, is subsidizing 45 cents out of every dollar the religious institutions conference. But there's a it's not established. Bible is different because it's university. It's a difference. Or, the, or well, what welfare is government employee has this money and they can use it for purpose uh, for, 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 for any school. Come up with all these qualifiers and come up with some gerrymandering yeah. alone of all areas. The Constitution somehow will be that won't fly. Either you believe that they can sit even indirectly through private choice end up in which, in which case the Constitution would amend this knowledge, then equal treatment is not established. Uh, Mr. Shapiro asked, uh, well, does this mean fund entirely private schools? Uh, if we decided to fund with law grants, all schools, public, <coughs> that would not be a problem. It is, of course, an extreme, because that gets to kind of a, a level of government uh, that, that, that uh, uh, in America today. By my point, equal treatment is not establishment. If you, it's the same as, give, as uh, uh, if it's whether religious or not. Uh, that is an institutional problem. Now the third, you see the, uh, that people take off the blinders. People go around with blinders, because on the private schools, and take the gut that's done in the government-run schools is sort of is, is something to be ignored when you're evaluating the examples of this. And people say, well, most of the money under religious schools. Well, yes, if you intend of all government funds that go to government-run schools. And yes, of the remainder, most of it goes to religious schools. But if you see that what the government is doing is switching to use their money at any school, whether government run, uh, then about 10% of all the money, 10% uh, uh, of money, 10% of the students uh, under this broader school. There are other more specific things. Now, most of what I've talked about before is probably pretty familiar to all of you. The points in my article, uh, uh, for most of it is, pre is pretty familiar. So I want to bring up the, that also fall in the category of taking off the blinders. Looking closly at the government runs mentioned about private schools uh, and, and uh, private goods. One argument against so it's facially even handed, it actually impact. And here's how the argument goes is that in practice, in effect, benefits some religious groups will benefit less from school choice. For example, uh, who, uh, who won't have a Jewish school because they're the only town. There's not enough. There's not enough of a critical mass to create it. So they use the new schools without violating their religious beliefs. So that's the argument. Initially, it's equal treatment. In practice, this Well, that seems pretty bad until you look at what turns out has a disparate impact. As, uh, as it has more of this discriminatory impact, except when you've got your blinders on, you ignore uh, on the new proposals. If you take out the blinders, you spread impact as well on whom? On those who are in the curriculum uh, or the current public school environment. There are people, uh, lots of uh, people, uh, or actually members of religious groups on schools, because they can't realistically bet the curriculum or environment or, or uh, that. So if you compare, if instead of just the program, you compare the disparate impact of the, uh, the current system, what you find is less. Now, people can only, benefits run only to those people and those religious groups. School choice people will be able to choose government run schools, other religious schools, secular schools, and so on. In any area, there will be some groups who say, well, but anybody who can project will be able to use the new system and we didn't benefit from the old system. So again, if you take uh, that whatever the flaws of one other point that is it was people with money comes pressure. The argument is hurt will hurt real privacy can be used in private schools, then there'll be strings coming. Now there are various problems with this simply of the funds, just government regulations. There's also the, uh, it would mean uh, that uh, it's unconstitutional or unwise to uh, allow Pell grants and such things to religious but the problem, the main problem with it, pressure ignores the mass. The theory is this: the schools will be faced with religious principles by accepting the strings. Or for, it's not the schools are required to accept the strings. It's just I understand that. I appreciate that. But today, either they must compromise the religious principles, 
or they must forgo government. It's the same kind of thing. Here they this care here. We'll give you this money, but exactly the same thing is going on here. Yeah. So here are much more intrusive. Big vouchers. But here the strings are every uh, that here is where you know the options. Whereas here, uh, the, uh, it seems to be the pressure will be somewhat less. Uh, uh, sorry, at the very most, the pressure will be the same. But imposed by the new system, but only if you are what's going on in the car. To raise something that doesn't exactly track time, heard it a little bit this morning about the school choice because it drains the money. This is a classic example of the blinders. If you don't ask the question, schools have the surplus money. And the reason why I have this the surplus money, public schools to be so bad for their kids, this extra money in the drain was all along as the government run schools got much that their parents decided and, and, and uh, uh, happening is this, the government run schools have had this result that comes from the fact that we made a commit that money. And now the thing is that some of the windfall, not all, return to the parents who could then use this money. That's the supply by these greedy school, uh, school choice of the money that was the windfall that came to the And again, if you take out the blinders, if you start government run schools have this extra money, the error in the anti-school choice. I, I want to close on one issue. My second point is if you have things set up in society, we find a bill, uh, tax exemptions, and so on and so forth, punishment. Uh, the third point is if you take that uh, equal treatment is not establishing, and if you that, that equal treatment is considered permitted, it's constitutionally required. Uh, but I think the right program includes private secular schools. It, can, it might discriminate, the government could discriminate between government runs, but it can discriminate against schools once it's stressed. And I just want to, in fact, actually, I, I've run out of time. details. But let me just give one example. There are three cases recently that have actually helped the school choice, but to very closely related questions. One just a lot of the Eighth Circuit. There's a generally available services for disabled kids. And the school district said, this is permitted here, that you could use these funds. No, no, we want to exclude religious schools. It's awful established. They discriminate against children who are kind of trying religion. Here, the religiosity of, uh, of uh, schools because of the religiosity. You know, that the speech clause of the First Amendment and the hostility towards religion violates even the next, the next area of the. Thank you very much. <laughs> moment that I spoke, people were already uh, at immediately <clears throat> everything I say, uh, so that we can get out of here uh, in a moment or two for some questions. If we talk about some of the policy, go back quickly to the establishment already handled quite well for our side. Many times talking about some of the state institutional issues that will continue to pose several programs. In terms of the policy issues, Jeff, you one view of the program in Cleveland, or one on Milwaukee, but they've forgotten that raises serious problems with them. It's been found that a large percentage of the kids uh, that are in the program are not, in fact, kids coming from already in private schools, so that the people that are already are in private schools. The state of Cleveland, in the first year or so, the program were under over a million dollars of most of it being used to, to set for kids to go to private schools in Cleveland. Again, the latest audit is showing the deadline uh, for the voucher program thousand dollars a year, not six or seven thousand. Educational audit that was done, significant educational advance in Cleveland, even though that is they can be to want to go to a school that have been referred to several times, even the uh, much revised producing. And indeed, there's in Cleveland and Milwaukee, surplus, as Gene suggests, but the schools are finding money taken away from it. And there is a significant uh, effort with respect to public schools as a result of the private school program. One example from Milwaukee programs all around the state of Wisconsin substantially reduces class sizes and uh, programs in public non controverted evidence in a year or two at substantial forming public schools. However, on the SAGE program in Milwaukee, out of Milwaukee. You have about a one, if you're a poor kid inside Milwaukee, it's of being in the SAGE program. If Milwaukee were instead devoted to city that are in poor performing poor benefits now, and from our perspective, for those <coughs> reasons, why you deem a bad policy choice issues, those are indeed considerable capital clause issues. I would respond to not discrimination against religion, to Indeed, that is the precise in the area of abortion, for example. The nation, not a violation of the state money being used for it. So I think that returning again to the GIs over and over again, the why can't the difference again is that in 
that sort of thing, the government benefit that was available without regard to the type of money to go to college, whether you go, and therefore providing a GI Bill a particular kind of choice and vouchers, because by definition, at least under the blind is off by changing the system. Under our current system, vouchers are available for choices outside the traditional for private, which means by definition, uh, religious institutions benefit. It is to say, it, it, to use the analogy, it would be to say, we're taking uh, your government paycheck that is now the institution whatsoever, and instead said only 10 stores and eight old religious mer merchandise. That's what's due, and that's why there's substantially <coughs> from the GI Bill. But beyond all of those arguments, which are thoroughly by members of our panel before arguments as well, let me talk briefly about the arguments of the so-called Blaine Amendment that kept it to Kevin. The reason that Steve and I are not the case that he's talking about in Massachusetts is now because we have many, many other that Kevin's going to win in the case that he's talking about. So we'll see. That even given the their due, uh, it, is, it is simply some legislators may have been motivated, so that is enough to overturn those state establishment clause provisions. Because meant that they didn't want there to be uh, being distributed and used by religious states that were involved. And that the states can go further than the federal government the clause that are a whole range. <coughs> and we, we do not think that the attacks that have been state anti-establishment clause were not, we'll have to see what happens. But even establishment clause issues at the state level, there are holes at the state level <coughs> and beyond. Jeff alluded to some of these already. You know, I won't go into the details of what could be uniformity and simply the command, at least based on the oral majority of the state Supreme Court, before you ever get to federal. Similarly, in a pending state case in court of administrative agencies or courts rule, they were illegal, not because the local school boards that tried to religious and, and other uh, simply didn't have the power under to divert money in that way. Those continue to be barriers, uh, even if these sorts of programs are suggested around the country. But finally, I think, you have the problem that was speakers of or then strings, or essentially accountability. The fact of the matter is that private schools are private <coughs> because, in large, they don't, indeed, altogether, they don't depend upon public taxpayer funds. But if, in fact, private schools are to depend on public taxpayer funds, the public has the right, and indeed, many would argue the obligation, to result. Take, for example, the state. There, there is in terms of accountability that's been imposed. One, and that is the requirement of random selection was one of the key or by the voucher program there, a constitutional muster and selection plans that by voucher schools in Wisconsin found that in fact many of them are not random specifically for preferences, for preferences for for preference. We in the NAACP fight structure. And in fact, have been threatened with cutoff the refusal to comply with state accountability requirement. But for example, take Texas, the very area. <coughs> vouchers are being to voucher school. One of the state vouchers that voucher schools may not hold children on the basis of resident ethnicity, academic achievement, or another requirement provides that schools in Texas must provide services for kids that want them. <laughs> may not expel students and the, for which they could have been able to. And a fourth requires performance that voucher schools and educational performance, as will be Texas, uh, with respect to expelled from the voucher program. <coughs> a few examples of the has been and will schools under those circumstances, a source that you wouldn't expect people from the Heritage Foundation publication of Dewey, who also oppose the fact. Dewey concludes that is subsidized private in France to Canada as the distinction from state school in America, the same fate acts in regulations on participating from a conservative libertism to oppose vouchers, laws, and policy provisions. Many people across the country believe government taxpayer funding should use. Thank you. Well, I imagine we could go on with questions. Uh, Leonard, do we have time? Lawrence, do you have time? 
early in my high school, two career decisions. One was I felt my coaches were intellectual, and the other was that I would not be an attorney. The, uh, Mr. Somerville's key statements about the teachers you contribute to the understanding about legitimate issues with regard to public education, the interface with the, for instance, in 30 years, state, national, or local, if I ever somebody said that they would not you walk a walkway right over there, Mr. Summer. International Study Center for Distance Learning, where I have supported <coughs> distance learning since I was eight. My wife, who is now legal, has been influential in a process that we have simply not acted. Leave the impression that, that somehow these crazy stand. There are two national unions, and one is the American Federation. Definitely, and for most of their history, think you're a part of my career, making sure that me or my colleagues in this city. The decision I made, which was the decision, they don't represent teachers in Toledo. In the American Federation of Teachers, we have an honor. Nobody, the president of my local union in the American. We have not made the same mistake that many other than that have made, and that is that they have given up their autonomy to some state or national uh, uh, union body. We haven't done that. That's why we, we have never discussion that would have blocked. I don't have a problem with homeschooling. I don't have a problem with any of that. I don't need if people don't educate the kids at all. Keeping them in school at <clears throat> age 16 is an advantage. So, Thomas, don't make this business you. There's a whole bunch of information seen that you need to get back to that that means something on the other side. I'm not sure if there's several little questions, but you want to respond quickly? Okay. Yeah, there was a question. Very for a time. I encourage all of you to have for our panel. Um, there's a significant distinction the EA and the AFT. The NEA votes every single resolution B6 this year. T has got a lot more respect than, uh, than when I speak for teachers' union. I do mean this fact. A single school choice will face challenges and, and uh, there may be some that I have a school choice plan of any sort the teachers union and it's probably the file suit to block as a practice of heat, that's almost more important than whether it's official or not it may be kind of that funds out the ACL you're going to like NEA you're not going to get any from the teachers union with all due respect for they're the ones who file the suits uh, let's assume they have uh, let's assume the uh, things without blaming anybody but Public school urban areas is failing. GM court one would accept that. You might be more inclined to prior legal technology than it's like lemon and whole what we're talking about here today constitutional. Well, I think the short my my short answer to that is 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 they they they, they won't accept it. I mean they 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 acknowledge it. I don't think in a opinion uh, they need it in their capacity in sense. I do not think that they will use it as a big altering constitution. And the reason for that is the policy response of even if you come up is too complicated and too shifting. It bases, I think, in constitutional theory. Well, obviously, we could go well on into the evening with this. We want to do that, but uh, we want to move on. And what I would suggest we do is going to be served uh, on the third floor. Uh, the way to get there is to leave the door open to make a right and to take the elements uh, to the right and go up to the third floor. There will be some more discussion between our participants and members of the order, and we encourage you to discussion as we're during, during lunch. Um, before we go, though, join me, uh, our moderator, our panelists.